The Florida Historical Society presents Florida Frontiers is made possible in part by the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund and by... The historic Rossiter House Museum and Gardens is in the O'Galley section of Melbourne, Florida. Preserved as it was in the early 20th century, historic tours of the Rossiter House include antiques, artifacts, and family heirlooms, and the 1865 Houston Family Cemetery. The last resident of the home was successful businesswoman and philanthropist Caroline P. Rossiter. The historic Rossiter House Museum and Gardens is available for weddings and other special events. Florida Frontiers is also sponsored in part by the State of Florida, Department of State, Division of Arts and Culture, and the Florida Council on Arts and Culture. The Florida Historical Society Press publishes books on a variety of topics relating to our state's diverse history and culture. FHS Press titles include Life and Death at Windover, Excavations of a 7,000-Year-Old Pond Cemetery, The Voyages of Ponce de Leon, Scholarly Perspectives, Hollow Victory, a novel of the Second Seminole War, Stetson Kennedy's Palmetto Country, and Walkin' Lawton. More information at fhspress.org. Wilfred. And I live here as well. I bet it's not what you thought this was, was it? I mean, it's more than just sweet tea and magnolia trees. This is where it all happened, right here in the kitchen. Because see, for all these years, it was the food that brought people back time after time. And who was making that food? Ah, those invisible hands. Historic reenactor and storyteller James Bullock portrays a late 19th century servant at what is now the Jimenez Facio House Museum. The Jimenez Facio House is located on Avalé Street in St. Augustine, the oldest street in America. Welcome to Florida Frontiers, presented by the Florida Historical Society. I'm Ben Broatmarkle. Colonial era homes and buildings have been on this site since 1572, just seven years after St. Augustine was founded by Don Pedro Menendez de Avales. Well, we do know that they were uh, very small structures. They were mainly built of wood. Um, as you know, this house is built of coquina. And we have uh, actually the title for all of the land from first from the 1570s, and then of course 1586 when everything is burned down by Francis Drake, that's when this street appears first on a map. That's why we say that the Avila Street, which at that point was Hospital Street because the Spanish hospital was in the corner, um, is the oldest street in the continental United States. They were mainly wood. Uh, they didn't start using coquina and uh, the, the more permanent type of materials until uh, after the fort was completed in 1695. And it really wasn't until the early, early 1700s when they finally said, okay, go ahead and use the quarries. But uh, so, so materials would have been wood uh, in this part. Uh, it's, it's the oldest part of St. Augustine. And uh, I have to throw in a plug that has uh, been proven to be the oldest street, Avalé Street in the United States. That's a proud part of the heritage here, and that's why archaeological digs have uh, been so proficient here. The coquina structure that is now the Jimenez Facio House Museum was built in 1798 during Florida's second Spanish period by Andres Jimenez. And he was married to a woman of Minorcan descent. Um, the Minorcans had come here during the British period as indentured servants to New Smyrna to work in a plantation, an indigo plantation. Indigo is very poisonous and they were dying by the dozen. Finally, some of them, as they happen, uh, led by Francisco Pelicer, comes into St. Augustine and asks for political asylum. It is Juana Pelicer, Francisco's daughter, who marries Andres Jimenez, and he builds his house. They lived on the second floor, and on the first floor, he had a tavern. He also had a billiards room. We actually have the license for the billiards room. And he had what we will call a general store. 
Andre Jimenez, who built the house, uh, he was a merchant born in Spain. He uh, actually lived across the street and uh, uh, this lot caught his eye and he had the structure built. His wife was uh, Juana, Juana Pelliser Jimenez and the name Pelliser in St. Augustine is huge because Francisco Pelliser was the gentleman who led the Menorcans out of New Smyrna in 1777. So that was her father. He was also a master carpenter and uh, we have every reason to believe that he was part of building this structure. So you have Spanish, you have, uh, you have Menorcan uh, blood in these bones, and, uh, and it was built to be a, uh, the downstairs had a grocery store, and uh, then had tavern, and had a large pool hall. The location of the house is two blocks away from the bay, People would come into the bay, um, sailors, and they probably would walk into town looking for a place to um, eat and drink. And we think that probably the third floor or the attic was also used as quarters for people that would come into the tavern looking for a place to sleep. Um, he was a merchant, so he will have all this merchandise. Uh, we also have inventory of what he had in the store because when he died in 1806, there was an inventory done of everything that was going to be sold. On the first floor, also there were two warehouses, um, which today are the west wing of the house. The second floor, which where we're sitting, is, uh, is the family residence. And then uh, the west wing, uh, upstairs and downstairs, was warehouse. So, uh, so everything was all about uh, retail business and, uh, and, and making, making money. This was, this was a blue collar uh, home, if you will. Each of the quarters of the town had their own tavern. Uh, it's very European. If you've been in Europe, you know that they had their own bars, their own little grocery stores, their little general stores. It was the same in St. Augustine. St. Augustine is a very Spanish town. The town plan was set up by Philip II in the 1580s. So it's still the same town plan. The, 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 the town is divided in quarters and every quarter will have their services. As the capital of East Florida, St. Augustine was transferred from Spain to the United States on July 10, 1821. This presented challenges to Spanish landowners like the Jimenez family. The family is a great example of what happens to families when the Americans arrive in 1821. You have some that decide that they don't want to deal with the Americans. They have no interest in learning a new language, a new culture, of having to practice a different religion. So they leave. And the government in St. Augustine, the Spanish government, encourages the people from St. Augustine to leave. And they offer land in Cuba. So you're going to find that a lot of people that were here in 1821 are probably living in Cuba today, which is really interesting. Then there are the other two that decide that they are going to chance it. They're going to stay in St. Augustine. They own property. They have been doing well. They are married. They have children. But then they leave for Key West because since these children are bilingual and they are adults now, they can now create roots, business roots, between Key West and Havana. And that's what the oldest son does. And the youngest daughter marries into the family of the oldest son, wife. So again, this is a very Hispanic family. You marry within your same social circle and many times within the same families. So we see all of this played out. We do know until 1819 that the house was rented. But again, the Spanish leave in 1821, there is this huge fight between the Spanish governor and the American government because the Spanish government has been told to remove all the government papers to Cuba. And of course, the Americans are saying, you cannot do that. How are we going to find out who's here? Where are the censuses? Who's paying taxes? What are they doing? So in that interim of what is happening, we lose track of who is here in the house. We cannot find them in the legal papers. And it's not again until the 18, late 1820s that we start finding again what happened to the house. Well, Margaret Cook and her husband bought, the proper, bought a third of the property in 1826. He died in 1827. So now she's a widow owning a third in this property and uh, she was the kind of lady that in 1828 she bought another third and in 1830 she completed the sale. And when she did that, the 
lobby is where the tavern used to be. The dining hall is where the pool table used to be. And then the west wing where the warehouses were became uh, divided up and compartmentalized into guest uh, quarters. This stayed the, uh, um, the family's area. Although Margaret never stayed here. She was quite wealthy and had other properties uh, that her husband left her. And she hired uh, Elizabeth Whitehurst. To, uh, to run the property. And uh, the Whitehurst have uh, a significant history in town of their own. Hello, my name's Moses, and I live here as well. When Mr. Cook bought this place eight years ago, there was a billiard table here. But she turned it into a right fine, high-class establishment. We got a full menu and a fully trained staff to serve you. And I got to make sure everything's perfect. Now you're going to start out like I did right over here. You're going to start out like I did, right here, fanboy. In 1838, Sarah Petty Anderson took over the boarding house when her home at the Dunlawton Plantation was burned down in the Second Seminole War. In 1855, Anderson moved to Tallahassee and sold the property to Louisa Facio. In 1939, the National Society of the Colonial Dames of America in the state of Florida purchased the Jimenez Facio House, restored it, and transformed it into a museum. You look back on what they did, World War II hadn't happened yet. Hitler still hadn't invaded Poland when they bought this house in 1939. The Great Depression was still on and nobody realized that the end was just around the corner. So they took a mortgage out. They took a real risk uh, when they bought this house. But that is the mission of the, the National Society of the Colonial Dames of America is to buy historic homes uh, in historic settings and to, to keep the history of America alive by telling the stories through these houses. Since 1973, a series of archaeological digs have been done on the property. Among the amazing artifacts discovered is a Caravaca cross. They find wonderful things. They find the pottery, but you also find the bones. You also find um, the trash pits that tell us what are they eating, what are they serving, what kind of plates they're using, what kind of china. And from all of that information, then that's how we furnish the house. Because for example, all the china that is shown in the dining room, we found pieces in the archeological dig. So we know, oh, they were doing this, this, the bandana blue and white china. So this is what they're serving. But of course, um, the house is known by the Caravaca cross, which is um, a cross, it's very unusual. It has none of, Nothing like that has ever been found in St. Augustine, and believe me, St. Augustine has been dogged many, many times. Carl Halbert said, the uh, retired city archaeologist, said this is the most dug property in, uh, in St. Augustine. And in 2002, he found uh, a Caravaca cross, a necklace pendant about that tall. It has a double bar for the cross, and it was commissioned in the 1660s by the Spanish Catholic Church to celebrate the end of the plague that had been ravaging Europe during the 1660s. The I Lived Here As Well exhibition and performances are taking a more inclusive view of the occupants of the Jimenez Facio House. It, it was very important to me that we tell the whole history of the house and that we get into the background of the, uh, not only the enslaved servants who lived here, but there were, there were free uh, servants of color you know, who worked in this house. I mean, you go from the second Spanish period, uh, being black didn't automatically mean you were a slave in the second Spanish period. Then, and then Louisa Facio owned the house from 1855 to 1875, which means she took this and kept it as a successful business from the times of slavery through secession, through civil war, through union occupation, through reconstruction. So the people who, who were enslaved when she bought the house weren't enslaved when she died in 1875. So the house has seen uh, a tremendous amount of American history in that regard. Unfortunately for us that are trying to document everyone that lived in the house, it was very difficult to document this stuff because they were invisible. 
in many of the censuses, you know that Luisa Facio might have owned 10, 10 slaves, five men, three women, two children, but you don't know who they are. You don't know how old they are. You don't know their names. So we have taken upon ourselves in the last year, in the last two years actually, to document not only the owners of the house, which were very well documented, but only also the guests and the slaves. Hearing that the property here was considering uh, the untold side of history, that there was this excitement of the discovery of, well, who was this person and who was that person? So it really hit me in terms of intrigue. I said, wait a second, this is, this is new and long overdue. I felt um, most of us were, were stuck with generalities about a very long era of American history. And in reality, it's not gone with the wind and it's not Uncle Tom's Cabin. In most cases, the truth was actually in the middle. You know, when you start researching people that are invisible, you get very creative. Um, and the first thing you do is, let me see what I have. Let me see what I, if there's any mention of servants in the literature. And in 1874, Constant Fenimore Woolson is here in St. Augustine. She stays in this house, and she spends a lot of time talking about the saber boy or Wilfred, and Wilfred is a black young man that is a servant in this house. So suddenly that opens the door to knowing, okay, I have one person, he has, he has a name, I know exactly what he looks like, not only because she sketched him, but because we have an 1874 photo, and if you look at the photo, he's in the background of that photo. So that becomes, like, okay, this is, this is so doable. Today is a big day. Frederick Douglass is coming to town and he's going to speak at the Opera House. And I got tickets to see him and I'm not going to miss it for nothing. Because, see, I can read a bit. I learns over at the Sisters of St. Joseph's and that's why I got me a new name, Wilfred. W-I-L-F-R-I-D. Wilfred. I lived here as well. Now, please excuse me. In addition to portrayals of servants who worked at the Jimenez Facio House, a permanent display of photographs and documents make up the I Lived Here As Well exhibit. That display is on the third floor of the museum where enslaved people stayed, but more recently was closed to the public and used as storage space. When I was contacted by Dr. Smith, uh, he told me about the house, and I said, well, gee, I would like to visit this third floor. I didn't know about it. And perhaps some people will find it odd, but as a room, the room began to speak to me. Maybe because it had been closed up for so long, I'm not sure. But I felt a very strong and deep connection to people who had spent part of their lives there. In December of 2019, uh, one of the workers uh, brought up, uh, said, hey, I've got this table, and I, I don't know where to put it. And the outgoing director said, uh, just stick it up on the third floor. And I went, we have a third floor? And, oh yeah, it's old, it's dusty, it's hot, you don't ever want to go up there. And I said, we have a third floor? It's kind of like what you see in the movies where they knock a hole in the wall and there's a hidden room. That's how I felt. And then uh, Turin Rodriguez Bo uh, Bodie, our uh, archivist, and James Bullock, started doing uh, about nine months of research and found the history of the third floor. We have the names of people who stayed there. Every name that James mentions in the tour, every name, every character he becomes is someone who actually lived in this house uh, during this, uh, this time frame that he takes you through. When you start looking at censuses, as, uh, as, at reports, at court records, and then you start finding them. Some of them have names, some of them are just invisible. The first slave that I document is Rosa. She appears in the will of Andres Jimenez in 1806. She's a mulatto woman. I was able to trace Rosa all the way to 1819 because I know that as the children grow up, Rosa is then leased to other people. 
So the Jimenez children are making money out of leasing Rosa to work in other people. And I know how much money they spend to make her, to keep her healthy, uh, what they spend to clothe her, and how much money she brought back in return. So I do know that there is a presence already in 1806. These photos were by and large portraits of people who you never would have met or heard about. And the first one that came, was given to me, was of a black musician in the Civil War era. And he was wearing a uniform. And I looked at the picture and I said, why, he looks very sad. And then we realized that he was probably in a band that was for the Confederates. They made him pose for that picture. They made him wear those clothes. They made him play those songs. And there was a sadness in his eyes that spoke volumes to me. You realize the cruelty of, of human beings, how cruel they can be to other people that are just like them. So it, it, was, um, it, it was very emotional at times. Um, but we felt as a group and as a staff that we were giving voices to these people that had never been allowed to talk about it. And uh, with the exhibit, we were able also to give images. And the exhibit, we organized it. So one side is what's happening in the United States, the chronological exhibit. The other side is what's happening in St. Augustine and in this house. And we start finding images that will, that are not original to the house except for a few of them, but that at least give you an idea of what's happening. Uh, St. Augustine is very different with slave until 1821. The Spanish relationship with their um, indentured serve, with, with their, actually with their slaves, is completely different. In 1821, um, they are allowed to go to Cuba. Many of them decide to stay, but the there were a lot of black people that were free in St. Augustine. They have always been free black people since the day Menendez arrived to St. Augustine. We have them documented. As a matter of fact, Ponce de Leon in 1513 had black Africans as part of the, his crew. We have them documented. So the relationship is completely different. So these free blacks that decide to stay in St. Augustine are doubly courageous because they don't want to leave their businesses, they don't want to leave their houses, but then they lose their liberty. Um, in order for them to even leave their houses, they have to have a white sponsor. I mean, the dignity of man is completely lost. So we were able to look through that, um, to document it, and to create the program that we created. The Jimenez Facio House was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1973. You've been watching Florida Frontiers presented by the Florida Historical Society. Visit us anytime online at myfloridahistory.org. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ben Broatmarkle.
The Florida Historical Society presents Florida Frontiers is made possible in part by the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund and by... The historic Rossiter House Museum and Gardens is in the O'Galley section of Melbourne, Florida. Preserved as it was in the early 20th century, historic tours of the Rossiter House include antiques, artifacts, and family heirlooms, and the 1865 Houston Family Cemetery. The last resident of the home was successful businesswoman and philanthropist Caroline P. Rossiter. The historic Rossiter House Museum and Gardens is available for weddings and other special events. Florida Frontiers is also sponsored in part by the State of Florida, Department of State, Division of Arts and Culture, and the Florida Council on Arts and Culture. The Florida Historical Society Press publishes books on a variety of topics relating to our state's diverse history and culture. FHS Press titles include Life and Death at Windover, Excavations of a 7,000-Year-Old Pond Cemetery, The Voyages of Ponce de Leon, Scholarly Perspectives, Hollow Victory, a novel of the Second Seminole War, Stetson Kennedy's Palmetto Country, and Walkin' Lawton. More information at fhspress.org.